In this part of the lecture, I'm going to talk about the three requirements for making a low voltage switch. So far, we've only said that we need the switch to be operated at low voltage, but there's actually two more requirements in order to make a good switch. So in addition to having the switch operate at a low voltage and turning on very quickly, we need to have a good on-off ratio. And the reason for this is that even if we reduce our voltage and our active power, we still need to keep our leakage power low, otherwise it'll be dominated by the leakage power. And so we'll see that we typically need an on-off ratio of around 10 to the 6 to 1. And then the last requirement on making a new type of switch is that we still need to maintain a high current, or if you're at low voltage, a high conductance. And that's because we want to keep the RC time high. And so we need to keep at 1 volt, 1 milliamp per micron, or at low voltage, to have the same resistance and conductance, 1 millisiemen per micron. So as we mentioned before, we needed to operate at low voltage. And that's because conventional transistors typically take 60 millivolts to get a decade change in current. And so that's sort of their subthreshold swing. And now we want to, of course, have a switch that turns on much steeper. That only takes a millivolt or so to get a decade change in current. And as we saw, the reason for that was the mo voltage matching crisis at the nanoscale. The wires only want millivolts in order to overcome noise, but the transistors rec are required to operate at one volt, and so we get this huge power penalty. But that's not the only thing required. Now we want to kind of understand what is the power required, or how, how do we keep the leakage energy low as well. And so keep minimizing the CV squared minimizes our dynamic energy. But now we also have to minimize our leakage power. So that tells us kind of what's the on-off ratio that we want. And to understand that, we need to look at what is a sort of a typical circuit block. So in a typical microprocessor, you'll have a block where you have two flip-flops and you'll have some combinational logic in between. And in this combinational logic, there's several key parameters. So one is that in a given clock cycle, it may only switch 1% of the time or 0.1% of the time. And that's because you're not switching every single transistor every single clock cycle. And that's given by the activity factor, alpha. Now another key parameter is sort of the fan out. That's to say that if you have one transistor, it'll drive several other transistors. So typically four to six times, four to six other transistors. And that's given by your fan out. Another key parameter is sort of just what's the capacitance of a single transistor. And then lastly, what's your logic depth? That's to say, between two flip-flops, we may have a series of multiple transistors. Typically, 20 to 40 gates will be in a series in a single clock pulse. And so using this, we can then estimate the delay and then use that to figure out what is the leakage power. So the delay through the circuit is going to be given sort of by your RC time. So first, we can ask, what's the capacitance? So our capacitance is going to be so the capacitance of one transistor times the fan out. And that's because you have to charge each of the additional transistors that you're driving. And then we also have a logic depth. And so what that means is that we're going through multiple stages, and so we have to just multiply by how many stages we go through. And then lastly, we need the resistance, which we can say is roughly the voltage divided by the current. And now we get this extra factor of 2, because we typically say that in saturation, a transistor operates as a current source. And when you model it that way, you get that extra factor of 2. And so then kind of just reiterating, the key thing that matters is not really the current, but rather the conductance, the current divided by the voltage for determining the speed. And so now given the speed, we can ask, what's the total power used? So we're going to have our dynamic power. That's a result of switching the transistors on and off and switching the capacitance. And then we're also going to have sort of our leakage power through the transistors. So the dynamic power is just the CV squared times how often does it actually switch, only 1% or less. Then at the same time, we, co we constantly have power going through the transistor, so your current times voltage. But now, if you want the energy per single operation, we have to then multiply this by the delay. And so then this gives us our total energy for each gate. And so we can then just sort of simplify this by plugging in the delay 
into here, and then combining terms. And what we find is that we have sort of the alpha CV squared, the dynamic power, times 1 plus the logic depth times the fan out over 2 times the activity factor divided by the on-off current ratio. So what you can see here is that we have sort of our dynamic power term and our leakage power term. And so then we can use this to understand what's the on-off ratio that we want. So the key is that we don't want our leakage power to be greater than the dynamic power or else we start wasting energy. So typically you would say that this term should be approximately 1. What that means is that our optimal on-off ratio is given by the logic depth times the fan out divided by the activity factor. And what's interesting is that this proportionality is nearly independent of the technology. So what this means is that you typically want the dynamic power over the leakage power to be 1. And so now what we can do is plug in some example numbers. So our, in a typical circuit, your logic depth will be around 20 to 40. And the reason for that is you don't want it to be too small because you have some overhead in driving each of your flip-flops. But at the same time, if you chain too many gates together, you're going to start increasing your delay and slow down your clock cycle. Then we have our activity factor, which is around 1% to 0.01%. And that's just because in a large complex circuit, most of the outputs won't be changing in any given clock cycle. And you have a typical fan out of around 2 to 6. And so when you plug these numbers in, we find that our I on over I off is around 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6. And so what this means is that for any logic switch, we need a good on off ratio. Otherwise, we're going to get dominated by leakage power. And now let's address the last requirement, the transistor speed. And so first what we can do is sort of figure out what is the RC time of a transistor and then look at how does that correlate to the clock speed in a transistor. And so if we say that typical transistors have a conductance of around 1 millisiemen per micron, which means a resistance of around 1 kilo ohm micron, we can just multiply this resistance by the capacitance. In a transistor, your capacitance is going to be dominated by the gate capacitance. So if you say you have a 20 nanometer channel length and say a typical 1 nanometer thick oxide, you can calculate your capacitance and then you'll come around 0.7 femtofarads per micron. And now just calculating your 1 over RC, that gives you a speed of around 1.4 terahertz, which sounds great. I mean, that's a really fast transistor. But we have to remember that the transistor is going to be much faster than the actual clock speed. And the reason for that is that in addition to charging the transistor itself, we also have to charge the wires. And so in current microprocessors, the wire capacitance is on the order of the transistor capacitance. So that means our delay is doubled there. And then we have to also consider the logic depth. If we say a worst case for the longest circuits, the logic depth is around 50, that now gives us a maximum clock speed of 1.4 terahertz divided by 2 divided by 50, or 14 gigahertz. And so we're coming pretty close to our current clock speeds. Then you realize that we have a billion transistors in a single chip. There's going to be some variations, so you need a little bit of safety margin, and that maybe your longest wires will have a little bit higher capacitance. We end up with our current clock speeds around 5 gigahertz. And so what this means is that just to maintain the clock speeds where they are, we have to maintain the conductance around a millisiemen per micron. And so we have to keep a high conductance density in any type of new switch. And if the conductance goes down, the speed of the transistors will go down, and therefore the clock speed of the circuit is going to have to go down. So what this means is that our new switch has really three requirements, not just low voltage, but also a large on-off ratio and a high current density. And so the challenge is satisfying all three of these at once in order to come up with a new switch technology.